I'm, a, I'm an accountant. I work with numbers all day. So I figured it would make sense if we look at numbers this, this, this morning. We're going to be looking at numbers, chapter 13. Um, but just a qu quick introduction that I'll read that I think relates to what I'm going to talk about. So just a quick little story. I've got it here. So it says, it says, Satan once held a sale and offered all the tools of his trade to anyone who would want to pay the price. They were spread out on the table and each tool was labeled hatred, pride, envy, gossip, lust, you know, all these different weapons that we all know so well. However, off to the side, there was a harmless looking tool labeled discouragement. It was old and worn looking, but it was priced far more than all the others. When Satan was asked why this was, he said, because I can use this one so much more easily than the others. No one knows that it belongs to me. With it, I can open doors that are bolted tightly against the others. So that's a quick, quick introduction. Uh, we're going to be talking about discouragement and the antidote for that. And we're going to, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start off in Rome, or Numbers chapter 13. So let's head to Numbers 13. It's uh, one of the first five books in the Bible. So let's, we'll, we'll start off in verse 1. And I'm going to break this chapter down into, well, f four, three sections. Um, there was a task that was given. Okay, we're going to look at what the task was. Then we're going to look at what the report was from the task. And then we're going to look at what the result was of the report. Okay, so there was a task, there was a, a report that was given, and then there was a, re a result um, from the report. So we'll look at those three things, and then we're going to talk about the antidote to discouragement. And, you know, I kind of titled this the giants of discouragement, but we can, you know, let's look at this. So it's verse 1. So let's, what is the task that was given to the people? The Lord spoke to Moses and said, Send out for yourself men so they can spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. And just to pause there for a sec, you'll notice that the Lord said that I will give to the sons of Israel. So we can see that there was a promise embedded in verse 1 that's good to note. He says, you shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, each one a leader among them. So the Lord sent them, or Moses sent them out from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord. All of them were men who were heads of the sons of Israel. And I don't need to go through all the names, but it lists all the tribes from verses 4 to 15. And from each tribe, there was one, one person who was a leader in that tribe who was selected to go as be one of the spies. Okay. In verse 17, when Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up from there into the Negev, that is, into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. And how is the land where they live? Is it good or bad? How are the cities where they live? Are they open or are they fortified? And how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Is there trees in it or not? Make an effort to get some of the fruit of the land. So for, for now is the time of the first ripe grapes. So... And then it says, they came to the valley of Eskel, and from there they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between two men with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the valley of Eskel because of the cluster which, which the sons of Israel cut down from there. So first tw 24 verses here, we can see that there was a task that was given. And you know, the task was given to the leaders of the tribes. The leaders represented the entire nation of Israel. And if we think about it, for these leaders, they all experienced the same things that all the children of Israel experienced. They were all in the land of Egypt as, as slaves. They experienced God's miraculous deliverance out of the land of Egypt. They, they, they experienced the Passover where the angel came and they experienced their families being passed over from the angel of death. They experienced the Red Sea being parted and them being able to come, into the, come out, of the, out of Egypt into the wilderness and then finally to the edge of the promised land. And of course, they experienced many, many miracles of God. And at the very, very beginning of this task, we also see that God told them, um, again, it's in verse 2, he says, I am going to give this land to the sons of Israel. So the people had exactly the same experience, the same history, the same leader, and the same instructions. Okay? So now we're going to look at the report. What was the report that was, that was given? So we'll start off in um, verse 26 of chapter 13. And I'm just going to read from 26 to 33. So they had their task, and now they're going to give the report. So verse 26, it says, They proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to the congregation of the sons of Israel. 
And they brought word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they said to them, we went to the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who lived in this land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people and before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of the land. We will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with them said, we are not able to go against the people for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out and said, the land where we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. We also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who were part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight and in their sight. So we see here the report that was given. And we'll note here that the report started off good. He says um, in verse 27, the land does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But in verse 28, some Bibles, my Bible starts with the word nevertheless. Some of your versions might start with the word but. And I wanted to note that when we're talking about the promises of God, if we have a but there, it's usually, it's often a sign of unbelief. They had the word but, and that's a, to me that's a very important distinction. If we think about it, guys, the prom, all the promises of God are yes and amen. There's no but there. All the promises of God are yes and amen. God gave them a promise in verse 2 that he, you will certainly take, take the land. There is, so all his promises are yes and amen. Like there's, here's a quick, a quick example of some other promises. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of us know that verse, but some of us might have a, a, a we think about it and we say, but, and then we have a but in our mind, but this, I have this problem. You know, it's, there's, there's a but there. Another, another, another exa- a, a promise, it says, all things work together for good. We know that verse in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who are called by the Lord, right? And there's also can be a but. But what about this thing in my life? Like, I'll give you a quick, real example. You know, a couple of years ago, I have, I, have, I have arthritis in my hip, and it's been getting worse, you know, for the last, you know, six months or so. And oftentimes, I'll have a thought that comes into me, you know, if it's like this now, what's it going to be like in, you know, six months? Or what's it going to be like in a year? And I have those thoughts that come into my mind. And I have to actually tell myself, all things work together for good. And it's, it's an absolute promise. God, who is our Father, who loves us, and he, loves each, he allows everything in our life for, perf- for his perfect will, he's allowed it for a perfect reason. But I have to tell myself that the thoughts come in, and if I dwell on those thoughts, you know, it's going to lead to discouragement. And then, of course, there's also this promise, his divine power has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Again, you could think about that verse, and you could say, well, but, you know, I have this sin I can't overcome in my life. There's again, there's a but. But if God's, if God's promises are true and all his promises are yes and amen, there's no room for a but. We, just, we have to accept it by faith. So let's go back to, the, back to the report here. And let's just look at a few things in here. So verse 28, they said, the people who live in the land are too strong. The cities are fortified and too large. You know, he, they said there's giants in the land. If, if, we look, um, if we look near verse, where is it here? Verse 20, 32, the land will devour its inhabitants. If we go there, we're going to be devoured by the giants. That was their attitude. There was one voice of reason in verse 30. That was Caleb. He said, we should take possession of the land. We'll overcome it. But that voice of reason was drowned out by all the other, all the other leaders of the people. So that was the report. So now we're going to go to the result. What was the result of this report? Um, and this is a, so we're going to look at chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 10. So there was the task given to spy out the land. They, had to, they produced a report. And now we're going to see what was the result of this report. Chapter 14. And we're going to, I'm just going to go from verses 1 to 10. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt or that we would have died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. 
Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of the assembly of the congregation of Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to the congregation of the sons of Israel and said, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will become our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of the meeting to the sons of Israel. So what I wanted to note here was these people had extreme discouragement from this report. And what I want us to note is the progression that, that discouragement can have in our life. Okay, so we want to look at that. When we can be discouraged, it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. There's progression that can happen through that. And that's what I wanted us to be aware of. So if we look, first of all, in verse 1, it says the people wept all night. It's a, we know it's an extremely serious thing you're facing with if you're going to be weeping like, you know, all night long. It's a serious thing. But it didn't stop there. In verse 2, the children of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So that led to grumbling and complaining. They were complaining, oh, I wish we had died in the land of Egypt. And we know grumbling and complaining is a sin. It didn't stop there. It, it then led to blaming. Verse 3, why is the Lord bringing us into this land? You'll see there, they actually blamed God for where they were at. So, you know, they wept, they grumbled and complained, then they blamed God. And it, discouragement didn't stop there. They said to each other, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. So appoint a new leader. That was the rebellion against what God had set up and return to Egypt. Let's return to where we came from. And for Christians, we, all, we know that Egypt represents you know, our life in the world, our worldly life. And they're basically saying, let's throw away everything we, we got from God. Let's just return to the world. And it didn't stop there. If we look even in verse 10, it was going to lead to murder. They said, let's stone them with stones. So the progression, what I wanted to comment here is discouragement, like I said at the very beginning, and it's a powerful tool of Satan. And it can lead to a significant progression in your life. Weeping, grumbling and complaining, blaming, um, rebellion, even to murder. It's an it's a extremely serious thing. It, discouragement can attack all ages. It's not just for grown-ups. It can attack kids. It can destroy thousands. And if for, for Christians, it can rob us of our joy and our usefulness to the Lord. So it's a serious thing. If we think about Elijah, Elijah did great things in his life. He, he caused thousands of the people of Israel to come back to God. But then Jezebel threatened to kill him. He became discouraged, ran away, and basically said he was the last one who, could, who was serving God, which wasn't correct. We can become discouraged if we believe the father of lies. Instead, we need to believe the father who never lies, which is God. We need to believe his promises. So that was the result of discouragement. It's a serious thing. We need to take it seriously. What I wanted to finish with was, what is the antidote for discouragement? We don't want to, we don't want to stay in discouragement. What is the antidote for that? What's the, well, how can we overcome discouragement? L to finish, let's go to Psalm 61. <clears throat> And I'm just going to read the first four verses of Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. And when it says when my heart is faint, I think that could also mean when I'm discouraged. When I'm overwhelmed, when I'm discouraged, um, I call to God. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been a refuge for me a tower of strength against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. So I love this psalm, and I'm just going to call out a couple points here when we're discouraged. We, we already talked about how all the promises of God are yes and amen. To me, that's the first defense against discouragement. We come to God's word and we, find, we know his promises. His promises are always true. We can, we can hold fast to his promises no matter what the enemy tells us. But let's look at this psalm. There's a few really important things here. Hear my cry, O oh God. When we're discouraged, we should come right to God and cry to God. Let's not linger in a place of discouragement. Let's, come, let's go right to God who hears our prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. No matter where I am in this earth, I could be in a, 
everything could be seemingly going wrong around me. I could be like at a terrible place in the world. I can call to God anywhere in the world and he'll hear me when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. God is that rock. He's, he's bigger than all our problems. When we're discouraged, we go to God who's bigger than our problems. And it says in verse three, you have been a refuge for me. I looked at that verse and it, it seems like it's a little bit of a, a past tense, which would tell me that we should think back to all the times in our life when God has been a refuge to us. We could, all of us could think back and think, hey God, you helped me here, you helped me over there. You have been a refuge to me. And we can encourage ourselves saying, God, you have been a refuge to me. You've helped me in the past, you will help me today. God is a tower of strength against the enemy. No matter what the enemy is, God is that tower of strength who's stronger than any enemy. And it says, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. We can hide in God's tent by faith. We can't physically do it, but we can hide in God. We can take shelter under his wings. You guys remember in, you know, I think it was Matthew 24 where Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as a mother hen would gather his chickens, right? That's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to shelter us under his wings. That's what he wants. We can come to him by faith. And we can say, Lord, I just, I don't know how to deal with this problem. I, I feel like I can get discouraged, Lord. I just want to shelter under your wings. And you know what? When we do that, he does help us. That's what he wants to do. So summarize. We want to guard against discouragement. It can lead to a terrible progression in our life. Um, we need to come to the Lord. We need to believe all his promises are yes and amen. And it says in Isaiah that no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. The weapon of discouragement that the enemy has will not prosper. If we believe God's promises, we cry out to God, we come to God, our rock, and we take shelter under his wings. So that, help, that helps me personally, and I just wanted to share that because I hope it will help you guys too.